Hello and welcome everybody. So this is section 10 of the notes and here we will discuss the effect of multicollinearity. And multicollinearity is a problem you can run into when you do linear regression. And that is when several of the inputs move in parallel, either exactly or mostly, and then it becomes really, really difficult to attribute changes in the output to these two inputs. So you can often tell it's one of them, but you don't know which one did cause it because they look so similar. Good, so that's what we're going to discuss. And there will be three sections. In the first section, I go into a bit more detail of what can go wrong. And then I'll explain to you how to detect that multicollinearity is present. And finally, we'll have a very short section on what you can do in this case. Good, so let's start at the beginning. The technical definition of multicollinearity is about the design matrix X. That's the matrix which has a column of ones in front and then x11 up to x1p and in the last row xn1 up to xnp and everything in between. And we say we have multicollinearity if and only if the columns of x are linearly dependent and there is strict multicollinearity if that is strictly true and one also talks about multicollinearity if that's approximately true just write approximately here and that in turn one way of defining this is there exists a vector v in rp plus one such that x v is either exactly or approximately zero and what that means is that one of the columns, at least one, can be somehow expressed as a linear combination of the other columns. So I believe the traditional way of running into that by not paying attention is if you try to encode weekdays, we haven't really spoken about that, but weekdays are not a numeric criterion. Let's say we just do working days, so Monday to Friday. And if our data has a weekday, one way of encoding that would be to just for every row write one in the column for the day where the sample belongs. So we could have yi, I just make up numbers. If one of the inputs is a weekday, one way of encoding that would be to just do a numeric vector which has one in the column of the corresponding day. Good, and that seems like a good idea at first, but it turns out that does not work. Namely, if there is an intercept, then the matrix X will have these data we have, and then, let me just write here, the intercept will add another column of ones, and then if you check carefully, the sum of these columns always equals that column, because in every row we have exactly one one, and lots of zeros, and here we have exactly one one. So in this example, we have multicollinearity in the strict sense because there is a one in every row, so if we sum them all up, we get that color. Good, so why is that bad? Technically that's bad because in this case, the rank of the matrix is one lower than it should be because this one here does not contribute to the rank because it could be also taken as the sum of this. And then if that happened, well, we have first what I just said, rank of x is less than p plus 1. And we also have, as a consequence of that, that x transpose x is not invertible. And for beta hat, our least squares estimator, we cannot use the usual formula because that would be x transpose x inverse x transpose y, and the inverse we just said does not exist. But it's worse, it's not that we could use a different formula, but beta hat is not uniquely defined, which means there's more than one. So you can still minimize the residual sum of squares, but there's no unique answer. The minimum is taken over infinitely many beta hats. And I want to illustrate this next with an example. So straight from the notes, if we have x1 and x2 and y, and if we just, to take the extreme case, assume x1 and x2 are identical. So let's just do 1 and 1 and say that one is the sum of them. And 2 and 2 is 4, 3 of c is 6, and maybe 4, 4 
is 8. So here, if you check, it's very easy. We can solve this with no residuals. So we can have y i as x1 i plus x2 i plus 0. And that is as good as it gets. Remember, we are minimizing the sum of the squared residuals. So that's always a positive quantity because it's squared. And the smallest possible value of that is 0. And that's what we get here. So beta 1 equals beta 2 equals 1 gives, I think we call it R of beta at the time, equals 0, which is the minimum. So we have solved the problem, one could think, but then, well, there is multicollinearity, so it turns out beta 1 is 2 and beta 2 is 0, all the words. 2 times this column with that column, we don't need any of this column. Or beta 1 is 0, beta 2 is 2, all the words. So you see there are actually infinitely many choices. You can pick beta 1. And then for beta 2, you just do 2 minus beta 1. So we have infinitely many solutions to the least squares problem. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that definitely requires some care and it is best avoided. And in particular, we are no longer able to attribute change in y to one of the inputs because you see here in this example, we can just choose whether we account it for x1 or for x2 by just switching around the weights like that. So interpretation of the model certainly gets more difficult. Predicting still works because whatever weight we take, if new inputs have the same shape, then let's just say we suddenly get 5, 5, then any of these choices would still get 10. So that's an important point. Prediction still works. Good. And when you encounter the problem in practice, if you have not stepped into this trap where you set up the problem in an unfortunate way, then when it occurs naturally, it will not be as clear as this. And there will not be strict multicollinearity, but it will just be the columns will be approximately independent. If there's noise, then you can never expect it to be exactly equal. And what will happen then is I have a numerical example in the notes which demonstrate that then instead of what we've just seen, so here we have seen any pair beta 1, beta 2 on this line is a solution to the least squares problem, which leads to zero residuals here and then zero residual sum of squares. Though that's in the extreme case when these columns are exactly identical. If things are affected by noise and the columns are only nearly identical, then you will get situations where if you plot a confidence ellipse, you will get confidence ellipses like this. So they go along this line, but there's kind of an end to it here and here. And the result is in that direction, you can determine quite well what's happening. So you get that beta 1 plus beta 2 must be approximately equal to 2, if it's like the previous example. But in that direction, there's a lot of uncertainty. So you get only very little information about where on this line you are. So that's the kind of things which happens. Good. So that is the effect of multicollinearity. And in the next video, I will talk you through how we can detect that we have this problem. So see you very soon in the next video.